Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 33, the final episode of my beta campaign. And in this episode, we're going to be finishing off all these interplanetary missions that I started episodes ago. But I want to show you a bit of a moral victory that I had first, and that was that I finally upgraded my research and development center. This was a long time going. I've lost track of how long I've been trying to raise the 4.7 million curb bucks that were required for this to happen. But after finishing off the missions from the previous episode, and after clearing out my building queue, uh, I had enough money to uh, finally do that. No, no. Yeah, honestly, it's, it's a bit of an empty victory in the sense that uh, I am not going to be building any more new vehicles, but uh, I don't know. I'll take what I can get. Now, if we look at the alarm clock window up there at the top left, we can see what missions we have coming up in this video. Now, some of these alarms are just for uh, mid-course correction burns, which I'm not going to show you because they're, frankly, really dull. I'm only going to show you the actual encounters with the various planetary bodies. But starting second from the top, we have the Kepler, and the Kepler is a lander on its way to Moho. Then next we have the Aldin Altusi. That's a Moho flyby mission that actually has already gone by Moho once and is on its way there for the second time. Then next we have the Ptolemy. The Ptolemy is a orbiter that is on its way to Duna and Ike. And then finally at the bottom there we have the Copernicus on its way to Grez. But uh, right now what we have here is the Shenkwa, and the mission is to put the Shenkwa into a heliocentric orbit about the Sun. This means that the probe's period must match the rotational period of the Sun and it must remain over a fixed point in the Sun, the fixed point being indicated by that waypoint we see there on the sun or curveball. But uh, I'm sort of estimating that that waypoint is about seven hours away from getting to the periapsis of my current orbit. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm going to be setting up a maneuver here to put the Shenkwa into an orbit with a period that is going to be 27 days. And in that way, it will do that 27-day period. So, And the sun, in the meantime, will do a complete rotation plus seven days more. And hopefully the two should meet again back there at periapsis, where, I'll, where I will do my um, a second burn to put it into its final heliocentric orbit. Now, because of remote tech, I am dealing with a... What do we got? About a 46 second delay. Um, so I have to use the flight computer to, to plan all of my maneuvers. Everything that I do is going to have a delay to it. And as we start visiting these other probes that are further and further out in the Kerbal solar system, um, you'll see these delays just getting larger and larger and larger. Now this particular burn is 6.2 kilometers per second, so this is huge. So we're just going to cut over to the... Um, to the burn and yeah it's a 45 minute burn which obviously I'm going to be doing using the physics warp at four times speed um, and I'm not going to show it to you all so you know the whole thing to you that's a little bit ridiculous. I will point out to note how close we are to the sun. I'm sure people have already noticed that that the, the sun is uh, pretty huge there on the screen. Uh, interesting to note though this is still not low altitude. If you wanted to collect low altitude science in reference to the sun I'm still not there yet. Um, I believe you have to get below a million kilometers, and I'm at about, uh, what, something like 1.5 million kilometers, but, uh, and, I, and I clearly have the Delta V to do it, but at this point in this campaign, I don't care about science anymore, I'm not going to unlock anything new, so uh, I'm not going to bother doing it. So our burn is just about complete here, we just got a few seconds left, five, three, to oh, the dump. And there we go, burn complete. So now we'll just cut to 27 days later as we come back towards periapsis. And taking a look here at the map view, it's looking like things are working out pretty well. Yeah, it seemed to be matched up 
very well with the waypoint that is on the sun. I've already set up my my uh, maneuver node to uh, put myself into my final heliocentric orbit, so it's simply a matter of executing that. And actually, while we're getting to that, I'll just take a note here at these uh, the solar panels here. Uh, this one solar panel is generating 114 kilowatts of electricity. Now to put that into perspective, when this was in Kerbin orbit, uh, it was producing two kilowatts. Uh, so it's producing quite a bit more, and clearly that's why, uh, that's because we're so clo much closer to the sun. Um, and what's working here is what's called the inverse square law. And the inverse square law says that the intensity of the solar radiation varies inversely by the square of the distance. What that means is, is that if you half your distance to the sun, then your, your uh, solar intensity or the amount of energy as well, which is related to the amount of energy you're going to produce from your solar panels is going to go up four times. So half the distance, four times the energy. A quarter of the distance, well, four squared is 16, 16 times the energy. So this is why you can see now, since I'm so much closer, I'm producing so much energy, I don't need both of these solar panels, so, so I might as well just shut one of them down. Um, the, the 114 kilowatts is more, way more than enough to run this ion drive. Uh, and I'm bringing a little bit of attention to this because as we move out towards my probes that are on their way to Duna and on their way to Drez, well, the inverse square law works in both directions, and yeah, there was some uh, mission planning that I overlooked, but I'll, I'll wait for that discussion for when uh, we get to those missions. And as we finish off this bird, and indeed finish off this contract for, for whatever that's worth, because I really don't care about contracts anymore, but this was originally a contract, uh, yeah, it's time to say goodbye to the Shenkwa and say hello to the Ptolemy, which is now in Duna's sphere of influence. Now, the plan is here is I'm just setting up my trajectory so that I am going to be in the same plane as Ike's orbit, and get my altitude down into Duna's atmosphere so that I can do myself a little arrow braking. Now I am paying very close attention to the G forces. I don't want to see them much above about 0.2 G because I'm going to be going through the atmosphere with the solar panels extended and with the antennas extended because I don't have the ability to shut this probe down. And so 0.2 of a G I think should be okay. And then the plan is to try and see if I can arrow brake and get myself an encounter with Ike. So I'm using trajectories here to predict my um, my resulting orbit after the air braking maneuver. And you can see the trajectories is saying that I'm going to be having myself a nice little capture, which is great. Uh, but I, I want that orbit to be lower, ideally to get an Ike encounter. Now it didn't take me too long to see that I wasn't going to get an encounter right away. So then what I want is an orbit that just goes a little bit past Ike's orbit, um, but continues to intersect it, and then it's just a matter of, you know, going around until I finally do, until I do get my Ike encounter. It really shouldn't shouldn't take too long, um, and and then I was sitting there going, thinking like, okay, how am I going to plan this maneuver so that I get the you know, the resulting orbit that I want. I'm going to have to do a little bit of retrograde burning at periapsis while I'm in the atmosphere. And I came up with this. I said, you know what, 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 let's use the maneuver node, bring down my apoapsis to the point where it sort of matches trajectory's uh, predicted orbit, and then just see how much lower, um, how much more extra I need to burn to get the orbit that I want, and uh, that turns out to be about an extra about 30 meters per second extra to get the orbit that I want. And I figure that should be the burn. If I just do a, a retrograde burn of 30 meters per second, that in conjunction with the arrow braking uh, should end up with me roughly into the orbit that I want to be. And it was in time warping towards my periapsis burn that I realized what the inverse square law giveth, the inverse square law taketh away and uh, I have an electricity problem. I am consuming electricity quicker than I can generate it. Uh, and that's because each of these solar panels is now only generating about 0.9 kilowatts, which is less than half of what they generate when they are in and around Kerbin. So, uh, and it's not enough to, to keep alive all of the various scientific equipment 
that I have on this thing. So I got to start shutting stuff down and it ends up, I end up having to shut down everything, the magnetometer, the various ScanSat stuff uh, that was scanning the planet and mapping biomes and stuff for me. All of that stuff had to shut down. Once that was all shut down, this thing started generating electricity once again and can keep itself powered up. But, uh, I don't know. I, I should have seen this coming. This this It's not like I didn't know about the inverse square law. I just, yeah, what, what can I say? It's poor planning on my part. Well, now it's time to redeem myself uh, with this brilliantly planned close approach, taking advantage of both uh, arrow breaking and a retrograde burn to get myself precisely in the orbit that I want. I mean, what could go wrong here? Well, it turns out plenty. You might be noticing that the uh, bar indicating the maneuver node is going down. It's looking like I'm doing the burn, but I am not burning. No, the arrow breaking is moving that downwards, not the uh, not the burn. Uh, that's a bit of an issue because uh, the flight computer already has the maneuver planned in it. It's going to execute what was the original maneuver, and now. Well, KSP thinks that I have overburnt this, so it spun the maneuver node around the other way. Uh, so now, yeah, now the craft is burning prograde, trying to correct for itself. And, of course, it's going to execute the maneuver as originally planned. So now I am burning prograde, fighting against the uh, arrow breaking that I was doing. And now I've completely lost control. <sighs> Yeah, so this didn't quite go as planned, and in fact, I didn't even end up getting my capture because of that silly little bit of prograde burning at the uh, <laughs> at the wrong time. But it wasn't that big a deal to set up a second maneuver once I was outside of the uh, atmosphere and get the orbit that I wanted to anyway. Thankfully, this thing has quite a bit of delta V, so it turned out not to be an issue. After that, it was a simple matter of setting up a small burn at Apoapsis to push the periapsis out of Duna's atmosphere, and then all I had to do was ride around Duna until uh, I got my Ike encounter. Uh, and that only took a couple of orbits, it didn't take too long. Ike is such a big target, and it's so close to Duna, you know, relative to the, the size of the planet and stuff. Everything feels close together when you're in the Duna system, so it's pretty easy to hit Ike once you're in Duna's orbit. Uh, and then I set myself, just with some pretty standard maneuvers, I set myself into a 250-kilometer uh, polar circular orbit so that I could do some mapping. And to get the mapping done, I guess I did a little bit of cheating. I turned on the ScanSat mapping stuff, which of course is going to start consuming electricity. Remember, I can't generate electricity quick enough, but I knew that if I left the probe and went on and did something else, that ScanSat would continue to work. But I also know once that the probe is not the target vehicle, it won't consume electricity anymore. And so I knew that ScanSat would work once, once, once I went off and did something else and this was no longer the target vehicle. A bit of a cheat, yeah, I guess so, but you know what, I, I wanted to get some of these biome maps because these biomes came in with the beta and I wanted to, you know, see these new biomes. This is my first uh, look, going to be my first good look at a good biome map that, uh, with, that came out with the beta version, but anyway. I think we're going to leave the uh, Ptolemy for now and move ourselves a little bit closer to the sun. Which brings us to the Kepler, just now entering into Moho's sphere of influence. And the Kepler is a lander. I'm going to attempt to land this on the surface of Moho, but before I can do that, I first have to get a capture. So what I got is, uh, yeah, I, I, I set up my burn, or my, uh, yeah, my, my maneuver to get myself into a low orbit, and this is a 2.9 kilometer per second burn. It is significant, and with just the ion drive that is on this probe, um, that's going to take a little bit of time, and one of the things that can happen is, if you're burning that much ahead of time, which you're going to have to do, you could be pushing, you're going to be pushing down your periapsis, whether you like it or not. So I set my periapsis higher than I normally would. I got it set at 50 kilometers. That feels more than safe to me. I, there's no way I can picture myself pushing the periapsis 
um, so far down from 50 kilometers that I might crash into the planet. This makes the burn a little bit more expensive because I'm not taking quite as much advantage of the Oberth effect as I normally would, but for the safety factor of it, I think that is well worth it. So I think I got this all set up, all well in the bag, but you know that that's when things start to go wrong. And the thing that went wrong this time is uh, an oversight on my part. I have this burn happening on the night side of Moho, and this thing is powered by electricity, solar electricity to be specific. And although I am nice and close to the sun and generating many, many kilowatts of electricity, uh, that doesn't do me much good on the night side. So once I drift into the uh, into the night, yeah, I end up draining the batteries that are on this thing pretty quickly, and the um, ion drive shuts down. And not only that, I also end up in the communication shadow from Kerbin, so this thing is tumbling out of control still on a escape trajectory from Moho. So I gotta set myself up a maneuver, get communication back, as it turns out, though, that all went out, went okay, and I was able to get my capture. Though captured, this still left me with a pretty crappy orbit to try and do a landing from, so this precipitated a few additional burns. Uh, the first was just a burn around periapsis, use whatever electricity I can to bring that apoapsis down and try to make this orbit a little less eccentric. Then came a second, mostly radial burn, to swing the periapsis around to the day side of the planet. And then finally came a third burn at periapsis to bring this down to a nice low orbit from which I can finally plan a final descent burn to get me down to the surface. So here is the plan for the descent. Um, what I want to do is I want to set my descent burn to be relatively steep, uh, steeper than what I normally would do. This is because of that 40 second signal delay. I, I really can't land this thing manually. I have to depend on the craft to deal with the landing. So I'm going to do a guess and know where I think things are relatively flat and then come down pretty steep. And then as the burn starts to finish off, I will uh, set uh, the craft to position itself retrograde relative to the surface retrograde vector. Um, so, and again, I'll have to think about the signal delay so that that will take into account, that will come in shortly after the burn is done. And obviously I will lower the landing gear at the same time. And then I will have to depend upon the Landatron engines to actually do the final part and touch it down. Now, if you recall, the Landatron engines, what they do is they, once you activate them, um, they will engage automatically and do a perfect suicide burn. You've seen me use them before on the moon. That was really just a test run. Here I'm doing it uh, for real. So I'm going to really depend upon those Landatron engines to do the work for me. Now to engage the Landatrons, what I have on this thing is a smart part. And the smart part will stage at three kilometers. That's the radar altitude being three kilometers. So when this thing is three kilometers from the surface, uh, the Landatron should engage, they sh or will activate, they should uh, start thrusting when it's time to do the suicide burn and hopefully all of this will be okay. I will qualify this by saying that I have never done this before. I have never landed a craft on another planet having to deal with a signal delay. So I am taking my best shot at this. So from here on in, this vessel is on its own. I'm not going to be putting in any more inputs. I'm completely dependent on those Landatrons. Now I did um, I'm going a little bit too much horizontal than I like, but I, I bailed on the um, descent burn a little early because I was worried. I was noticing that vertical speed increasing, and uh, I wanted to get those Landatrons engaged as quickly as I could. Uh, remember that those Landatrons will engage when the altitude is at 3 kilometers, and right now we're just about, the radar altitude is 11 kilometers. The other thing to take a look at is the suicide burn distance, oh geez, the suicide burn distance is already negative. That's not good! <laughs> oh no! 
Maybe it's messed up because the Landatrons aren't engaged. I'm going to pretend that. I'm going to pretend that. I, I, I'm going to still have hope. Uh, we got six kilometers to the surface. Oh, I'm thinking I probably should have engaged those Landatrons while I was still in orbit. That would have been a much more smarter thing to do rather than to rely on the smart part. Four kilometers. Remember, they're going to engage at three kilometers. Three kilometers, there was a staging, but nothing happened. And my suicide burn's still negative. And there's, yeah, this is not good. Oh, dear. Okay. Learning experience. Learning experience. <laughs> Don't depend on those smart parts for the Landatron. Engage the Landatrons from orbit. So, nothing left to this except to learn from it. Now, I do have a lander on its way to Drez. So, we'll get a second shot at trying to do a landing in this video. But for now, I think it is time to move on. But before we go on to something new, we'll take a quick stop with the Ptolemy, which has been busy mapping Ike. And I think it's been do spending enough time mapping Ike. I want to get it around Duna and get a Duna map out of this thing as well. So... To transfer from Ike to Duna is pretty much the same sort of a deal as transferring from the moon to Kerbin, which I've done so many times, I don't think I need to talk about it uh, too much. But uh, the one thing you want to do is you want to burn in the direction that is opposite to the direction of Ike in its orbit. But because we are in a polar orbit, to accomplish that, what we want to do is time warp to the point where the plane of our orbit is tangential to the direction of uh, Ike in its orbit. And that will allow us to burn in the direction that we want to go and escape Ike and get into Duna's orbit. Now once in Duna's orbit, we want to get I want to put myself again into a polar orbit, a circular orbit of about 250 kilometers. This requires a couple more maneuvers, but nothing that you haven't seen before, so I don't want to spend too much time with it. I think it'd be more interesting to move on and go towards and go to something else first. And that brings us to another quick stop, this time with the Aldin Altusi, which we last saw several episodes ago flying by Moho. And if you recall at that time, I put it into an orbit that had a period that was twice that of Moho's so that I could bring it around and encounter Moho once again. And you can see here, Oh, it's coming in for an encounter all right. Now, the original plan was to crash this thing into Moho because on the lander, the Kepler, there was one of those interstellar seismic probes um, that requires an impactor in order to record a seismic event and to collect some science. So I did plan on crashing this thing into Moho. Well, at this point, I see no reason why I should be altering that plan now. So the thing is, I'm just going to let it crash right into Moho. So here it comes, coming into Moho, coming in at a blistering pace. Yeah. Oh, I think I broke the planet. And that brings us to our final mission, not just of the video, but of the entire series. This is the Copernicus, which has been in space for 540 days, and it is finally closing in on its closest approach to Drez. Now, if you thought the uh, Ptolemy around Duna was having electricity problems, well, that ain't nothing compared to this. Each of these solar panels is only generating a feeble 0.28 kilowatts, which isn't even enough to power that dish antenna. So no matter what I'm doing, this thing is losing electrical power. Now, thankfully, I have already got this uh, maneuver node put in, and it's into the flight computer to be executed. So even if the power goes out, it will still uh, execute this burn. Now, all hope is not lost because the nuclear engine... The, the LVN nuclear engine that is on this thing um, is pretty good at generating electricity. So when the engine burns, it will generate more electricity. So well, hopefully that will give me enough to finally get this thing down. And the whole idea of this thing is to get it onto the surface. This is a lander, and this is going to be my last chance to land something on, a, on another planet uh, in this particular series. Now... 
I had set up this maneuver with the idea that this thing was going to do some mapping before doing the um, before doing the final landing. So I have my the apple axis of the maneuver set to 250 kilometers, but that's out of the question now. Uh, there's no way I'm going to do any mapping. I just want to get this down to the surface. I don't care about maps. I don't care about science. I don't care about anything. I just care about landing. And if I want a serious chance of putting this down onto the surface safely, I need to bring down that apoapsis. I need to have a lower orbit than this. So I set up another maneuver node at the periapsis to bring my apoapsis down. Um, and uh, I want to get this into the flight computer before the electric, the electric charge that I had built up, thanks to the atomic engine, ends up running out. So I get that into the flight computer, and then I think about orienting the craft so I can get the most out of those solar panels um, from the feeble sunlight that I am getting. And I hesitated putting in the orient towards the maneuver node, and that turned out to be a bit of a mistake because by the time I had come around to the plan at the other side to my periapsis again, I had lost electrical power. I now no longer have a communications signal, so I can't uh, put in that orient to the maneuver node. So when this thing, when the um, the maneuver gets executed, the craft will be at the beginning at least oriented the wrong way. Now it will orient itself the right way, but during that time, the engine will still be firing. And then I came up with the idea, wait, 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 I can, I can still save this. What I'll do is I'll nerf this engine. I will turn the thrust down on this engine so as it's orienting itself around, it won't be thrusting wildly in the wrong direction. And then when it's pointing the right way, I will just crank up the thrust once again. And again, while this engine is firing, electricity is being generated. So the next part of this is to see if I can set up my descent burn, my final descent burn, and get that into the flight computer before I lose all electrical power and lose that communication link. But that wasn't going to happen. It wasn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't get it in fast enough. The electricity ended up running out. I lost my communication link. I then lost all ability to give this thing any commands whatsoever. So although I do have it in a nice orbit that is workable for me, I have no way to give it any more commands. So this seems to be the end. I, I'm sorry to have to end on such a feeble and sad note, but it is what it is, and this is going to have to be the end. Or is it? Uh, what you see me doing here is deactivating the antenna. With the antenna turned off, this thing will start generating electricity once again. And once I have enough electricity, well, I plan on turning that antenna back on. Now, you might very rightfully be asking yourself, wait a second, how do you plan on turning it on again if the antenna is off and you have no signal? And for that matter, how can you even turn it off if you have no signal? Well, I'm going to have to explain. Now, I, actually, I was going to have that be the end when I finished that particular play session just now. I was planning that was going to be the end of it, but then I was lying in bed, literally lying in bed that night, and, um, you know, over the last little while, I've been kind of scouting out new mods because I'm thinking about my next play playthrough, and one of the mods that I have scouted out is a mod, well, actually, not really a mod, it's really a mod of a mod, called Remote Tech XF. And what the XF stands for, I, I really have no idea. But what it does is this. It modifies Remote Tech. It works exactly the same way as Remote Tech does, except for one small change, and that is that you can control the antennas without having a connection. And I actually like that idea uh, for a number of reasons. One is being able to... Uh, put your probe into a kind of a hibernation mode is a pretty normal thing to be able to do. You should be able to shut down your probe to be a, and cons to conserve power and be able to wake it up later. That's something that is actually done. And secondly, it, it avoids that frustrating thing of having an entire mission fail for the sole reason that you forgot to raise an antenna at the appropriate time. So this was something I was going to install anyway, and as I was lying in bed after that previous play session, I, I sat there and I went, you know what, I want to go for this landing. I, I, I want to end the way I went. I want to try and land this thing, so that's it. I'm, I'm going to 
put in this remote tech XF that's going to give me the ability to control the antenna and that's how I was able to do what I was able to do. So now the only thing left to do is to let this thing go round and round and round and slowly build up its electrical charge. Uh, one unfortunate thing is is that because this orbit is so low I really can't time warp. In fact when I'm below 10 kilometers I can't time warp at all. So this is going to take a long time so I'm going to just cut to the point where I feel like that I have built up enough electrical charge that I can safely go for it. So the landing profile will be very similar to what I tried to do with Moho which is to set up a descent burn that puts me in a relatively steep descent and to try and place it in such a way that hopefully I will land in a fairly flat spot though you can see here uh, my landing site is in the dark right now, so um, well, well, we'll we'll have to see what you go. I, I'll just have to take my best guess, but it looks kind of flattish over there, I think. Anyway, uh, and we'll get that into the flight computer. The one thing I will make sure to do different is to engage those Landatron engines while I'm still in low orbit, uh, so there's no chance of them ending up being activated only when it's too late. Um, then it's a point of waiting for the burn and trying to time um, the various things that also have to happen right after the burn is complete. Now I am working with an over two minute signal delay so t and the burn is going to be less than two minutes so it, it's a little tricky but uh, let's see here I, I've got to make sure that I descend the landing gear and then point the craft in a along the surface retrograde vector and then I also, and this one's a little different, I have to separate off the nuclear engine that's down there at the bottom because the landing gear uh, will not extend past the nuclear engine. I thought that was a simpler solution than trying to put in some sort of structure to get the landing gear to go down below the nuclear engine. And the burn is now complete so now it's just a matter of waiting for these other actions to happen. Again, at this point, the probe is on its own. I really don't have the option of putting in much more in the way of inputs. Um, I killed off a lot more of my horizontal velocity this time. My horizontal velocity is now only you know, it's getting close to 50 meters per second, which is a lot less than what it was when I was on Moho. And that has to do with the fact that we got this more powerful atomic engine as opposed to the ion engine. Uh, oh, we're coming to, let's see, the separation of the engine should be coming up in just a few seconds. There that goes. And the gear. And then we should be orienting ourselves retrograde along the surface vector. The surface retrograde vector. And there that goes goes it looks off on the nav ball but I'm on orbit mode put it in surface mode no I'm right on it this is looking pretty good and let's see my altitude 10 kilometers above the terrain impact time a little over a minute so that's good that's good I this is feeling a, much better than it did with moho I think if I were to do that um or whenever I get around to doing that moho landing again the thing I would do differently is not just have that burn be just a pure retrograde burn, the descent burn, but give it a, a reasonable amount of uh, radially up component to that burn as well to um, try and get it so that it doesn't, you know, the burn takes so long with the ion engine that in that time you begin to fall and uh, you need to sort of prevent that to give yourself a little bit more hang time. But this is looking pretty good. What what do I got for a suicide burn distance? Suicide burn distance is just getting to four kilometers well into the positive numbers. That's nice. Again, that suicide burn distance will give you an idea of when the engines will come on. Uh, altitude above the train, just past three kilometers. Two kilometers suicide distance. One kilometer suicide burn distance. Those Landatrons should be coming on any moment. There they go. Oh, there's the engine hitting the ground. And touchdown. And, oh, it's a little confused. 
It's very confused. It's trying to still stick to the surface retrograde vector, so we better turn that off. Uh, toggle on. Actually, what I should do is get this thing. I'll just use the custom one and get the pitch to be zero. Oh, this is interesting. Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, I'm not sure if it's break dancing or if it's like, you know, a landed fish <laughs> at the bottom of a boat. Oh my goodness. And just to make sure people see what's going on here is it's trying to stick to a surface retrograde vector. But of course, as it's flopping around, the, the retrograde vector is also moving around. Oh, I'll have to come up with a plan for this for next time. I mean, it's on the surface, and oh, I was so distracted by this. I don't want my pitch to be zero, of course, when this is done. I want my pitch to be 90. 90 pitch is up. Zero is horizontal. Well, that'll be entertaining as well. Oh. You know, um, yeah, so it's going to take a, about a minute before anything happens. So um, I don't want to cut past this. I think it's a little too entertaining, but I guess I can time warp it. Well, I don't mean time warp it. I'll, I'll go to four times speed with the with the video editing. Uh, I didn't want to time warp this because I, I'm amazed things aren't breaking. And if I go into physics warp, I'm almost guaranteed, I think, to break something. So I just sort of let it go. Okay, here we go. Oh, it's going to be interesting when it tries to go a pitch of zero. At least that should get it to stop flopping about. Whoa, whoa, wow. Now it's the planking. Oh, that's awesome. How on earth is that solar panel not breaking? <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, low gravity and ridiculously high torque on those reaction wheels are a potent combination, aren't they? Okay, about to put the pitch to 90 in 10 seconds. Nine, seven, six, five, four. Okay, let's see what happens here. Here we go. Uh, oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Touchdown! Perfect! Just the way I planned it. Okay, well, I'll have to come up with some sort of plan for the future of doing this, but as far as I'm concerned... I'm going to call that successful. We are on the surface of Drez. Nothing broke somehow. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to call that uh, a done deal. Okay, so I'm glad to end on something that's at least semi-positive. So this, like I said, is ending this particular series. But I will be going on into a 1.0 series soon, just waiting on one or two more mods, and that is going to be it. I do hope to see you then, but for now, we're saying goodbye to beta, and hello to 1.0.